All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here for the API and API creators panel for San Diego Comic Con International, the original comics pioneers. Um, today, we are joined by um, Ram. I'm sorry, how do you say your last name, Ram? Uh, it's Venkatesan, but you can just say Ram okay, V. Ram V. All right. Yeah. Ram, Ram V and uh, Jeremy Holt and Pornsack Pichashot. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. I got it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first of all, you guys, um, we're all, you guys all work um, on image titles, correct? That's and, correct. Um, if I may, um, I'm going to go clockwise and have you guys um, briefly introduce yourselves and, um, you know, what projects you're working on and, you know, and all that good stuff. So let's, let's start with Ram. Yeah, um, well, my name is Ron V. Uh, I, I am a comics creator, uh, done work uh, previously at Image with Paradiso, uh, and, and now have a graphic novel out with them called uh, Blue and Green. Um, I also write Catwoman, Swamp Thing, Justice League Dark, uh, and the newly announced Venom upcoming at Marvel, um, amongst other short stories and graphic novel projects uh, with other publishers. Awesome, thank you, Ram. And Jeremy, if you can introduce yourself. Sure, uh, Jeremy Holt. Uh, I'm currently doing an image series called Made in Korea. Um, I've previously done a um, romantic comedy graphic novel through Comixology Originals called Virtually Yours, a two book series um, about Harry Houdini as an action adventurer historical fiction through Inside Comics and um, Skip to the End, which is a time travel um, sci-fi book through, through Inside as well. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. And last but not least, Pornsack, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Pornsack Pichachot. Uh, I write for comics and TV and comics. Right now I have a book that's out called The Good Asian uh, with Alexander Tafengji. Uh, my previous book for Image, Infido with Aaron Campbell is a, was a horror book. Uh, the Good Asian is sort of a crime noir in a genre I'm calling Chinatown noir. And yeah, and that's pretty much what I do in the world of comics and I write some TV on the side. Awesome, awesome. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of uh, before I get to the the, the broader um, um, toss up questions, I'm going to address you guys specifically um, on on some of your projects. So get kind of the heavy heading questions questions out of the way. Um, what's top of mind for me? Um, and let's start with uh, Jeremy. So Made in Korea is is high on my to to read list. <laughs> There's so much to read, and you guys are such awesome creatives. So Made in Korea is an interesting and unique take on the immigrant experience and identity. How much of your own experiences influenced that story for you? Uh, it was a direct influence. As a transracial adoptee, I wanted to explore a sci-fi story that was interesting to me and I've always loved artificial intelligence. And the good AI stories I've seen, to me, they are rooted in an adoption experience. I just haven't seen anyone do it directly. So I thought, you know, with my background, it was a, a perfect opportunity. Awesome. Yeah, I find it really interesting because, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a foreign person being adopted by American parents. And then you have that duality of, of them being AI as well. So there's that al human alienate, alienization, sorry, I saw my second cup of coffee, um, that you're dealing with. That, that's really interesting. So um, let's move on to, let's see here. Sorry, I'm reading my notes. <laughs> let's move on to Point Hey. So... Um, let's, let's talk about uh, Infidel real quick. Cool. Um, that one, uh, it's Chloe and I were talking about it earlier. It's, 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 she, she warned me not to read it alone in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's already like, okay, I'm, I'm in. But, um, you know, I was reading your biography and being Thai American and the protagonist being a, a Muslim female, um, how did you approach writing that character for, for Infidel? Well, you know, what, what, one of the funny things about Infidel is that sort of no one... The, 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 you know, the conversation people actually haven't had is because that character is Pakistani, I'm writing another Asian American. So we had, there are sort of a lot of touch points and that the touch points in the family are very sort of similar to mine. And if anything, the, uh, my sort of way about it was writing an Asian American experience, um, but because of her religion, it, the world treats her differently and, and she must react accordingly. But in terms of the family dynamics and those sort of dynamics there, the overlap 
you know, be, and, and I certainly have a lot of sort of Pakistani and Indian sort of friends, you know, uh, and, and so I've definitely been able to draw from common experiences that we've all had so that I know I, I have sort of that in common with them. And then from there, it was sort of the research and talking to their Muslim friends to sort of see how that aspect of the character shifted uh, that character's experience from sort of what my, you know, what I directly related to as sort of a uh, Thai American sort of male uh, man. So, uh, so that's kind of how I sort of, you know, ap approach that. Yeah, it's interesting. Um how I phrase that question because um, from my experience and uh, among my Indian friends, um, India and Pakistan are kind of like the forgotten Asian community because when people hear Asian, they default to Chinese, Japanese, whatever, Far East Asians or even sometimes even the Southeast Asian community yeah. mostly is, is, you know, is kind of overlooked and or lumped in, you know. So um, so, so that, that's an interesting point. And which brings me um, to, to Ram. Hi, Ram. <laughs> hey. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we, we know you have a newborn, uh, so yes. congratulations again. He's also writing thanks, more thanks. books that he can keep track of. Yeah. I noticed, yes. Newborns, so, books, you know. <laughs> I must say, brother, you look amazing considering everything you're juggling. <laughs> so I give you kudos for joining us again. Thank you. So, um, so uh, Graffiti's Wall. Is, yeah. is, is, is a visually and story wise is, is stunning and I love it. And um, with the two works um, that, I ref, uh, that I've been made aware of, uh, Graffiti's Wall, and um, I believe the other one is uh, Blue and Green, there's a, there's a strong musical presence in both of those stories. Sure. And I, I just want to ask you um, how does music, how much does music play a part in your creative process, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I listen to a lot of music um, and am an amateur musician. So if I pan my camera, you'd be able to see my Gibson Les Paul sitting in the corner there. Um, but um, yeah, music's always been a, an interesting creative outlet for me. Uh, but I think beyond that, with, with regards to the story in itself, I think music is such a unique and underexplored cultural facet of who we are as people, you know, the kinds of music we enjoy, the kinds of music we grow up listening to, um, and the, the sort of generational aspect of, of what that means, what it means to be a musician, what it means to be a black musician, what it means to be a street musician in India, all of those things uh, are, are culturally relevant and, and speak about character and their lived experience. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I feel like it's a it's a shorthand for me to kind of explore things about characters without having to you know spell them out and talk about them. Um, rather, let readers kind of experience their that by connecting with what they should be perceiving as music, even though it's a it's a visual medium. Yeah, I mean, uh, to that point, I, I read another thing you were saying about uh, Graffiti's Wall, where the the, the Indian rap, um, you know, it, it's an amalgamation of, or it crosses between Hindi and English, and it comes from, of course, um, lower income, mm -hmm. you know, communities. Mm -hmm. um, and do you see, like, you know, really relevant parallels between that and America's, American hip-hop culture, and where we're, we're American hip hop music comes from. Sure, and I think I think there are there are a lot of parallels that are very interesting to look at. Um, in in that regard, um, these are the, the kids who are doing Indian rap are, are often from poorer neighborhoods, um, and and so haven't quite had the kind of educational opportunities that a lot of well-to-do kids have, but they've learned to rap by watching American hip hop being performed on. MTV because you don't go to school but you have access to TV in India and that's that's a that's an unusual sort of place to, to find yourself in where you're trying to then translate your knowledge of your mother tongue which may not be English but you're trying to translate that to your experience of listening to something that is in English but I think the common thread is this is the feeling of of angst is the feeling of you know I'm having to struggle I'm, I'm living in a different place. Uh, you know, you don't understand my experience. And I think that commonality really ties in everything. So, um, you know, for me, part of the re reason for exploring that in Graffiti's Wall was I felt like 
all the representations of Mumbai and the stories we tell of these places had been told by people looking in from the outside, you know, Danny Boyle do, doing, um, what was that one? Swan Dog in Air. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I felt like, like there is more there than sympathy for the poor. There is also the ambition of the poor to be great and, and, the, and the drive to do well. And, and, the, and the fact that that is irrepressible in a, in a city that is so oppressive and so competitive in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and to show that sort of represented through the the anger and the poetry of rap, I thought I thought was an interesting interesting point of view to take. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, you know, speaking of of that drive to be successful, you know, um, and this this I'm sure you guys have been asked this question a lot. You know, when you decide to take a career uh, in a creative path with your careers. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how your your family took it, if your families were supportive of it, um, because of course um, I have that answer that's common with a, a lot of people that I know, where when my parents decide I want to do art for a living, it was like the oh no, you know that's just a hobby, you know get a real job, you can do that on the side and still it's successful. Um, I, I see some knowing nod there. <laughs> And um, before, but I tell my parents what I'm doing. I'll let you know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, they'll, it'll go over fine whenever I bring it up to them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if they understand it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you do again? Yeah. What do you do? Exactly. And it's funny because um, one day, you know, growing up rebellious as a teen, I was first generation American here. I took it as being dismissive of my path, and being being now being older and a parent, I understand that it came from a genuine place of caring and concern, it wasn't that they weren't dismissive about my path of wanting to become an artist for a living. It was, how are you going to survive? You know, my family came from a poor family. They're seeing other occupations as, as um, a source of steady income or, or just a better path to success. So, you know, um, so, so I, I understood from that point that it wasn't that they were dismissing art as a legitimate thing. It was just they're more worried about the struggle because, of course, they've they've heard the struggling artist stereotypes and they've seen, um, you know, professional artists kind of struggle through their careers. So I just want to hear from you guys. Um, you know, let's start with Jeremy. You know, if you had any experience with that, and you know, and how did you deal with it? Um, I, I guess I have a mixed review about this because for some reason, my parents let me go to art school, which I look back on, which was a huge waste of time. Um, <laughs> it's the most expensive thing I own is this piece of paper that is tucked away in a drawer. Um, but I, I don't think they've really understood comics in the sense of the business of it. I mean, to be honest, there isn't a lot of money in comics. Uh, so I've never really attempted the full-time freelance and I, and I, a long time ago, I was reevaluating my goalpost. And for the longest time, my goalpost was to be a full-time writer. And when that wasn't happening, I was quitting constantly. I was like, I can't do this. I don't do this. And then once I realized that it's kind of paramount as a creative person to move your goalposts and that's okay, then I found the enjoyment of the work again. And at this point, I don't think I'm ready to give up my day job because it would change my relationship with the creative work. And I'm not ready to make my creative work my sole source of income. So... I think my parents um, appreciate that I'm just not, I'm not jumping headfirst into the freelance pool. How about you, Porn Tech? Uh, it's funny. I, I think a lot, like, and I don't know how, 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 how Ram and Jeremy feel about this, but like, I feel like to be in comics and have immigrant parents is like, like the thing on top of the, th it, the thing on top of the thing, because it's already just like, you know, I want to be in the arts and like, eh, okay, now I want to be in comics. Like, like of all, like, the, like, cause you can kind of say like, I want to be a musician or a, you know, or a novelist and all that kind of stuff. But, and, and like, it, it's a lot for them to wrap their heads around that. And like now comics are cool, like in the past 10 years or so, they're making movies and making a lot of money off of it. But before that, they're, they're, they're just trying to wrap their heads around, okay, so you want to go down this artistic field and you pick the one that's the least respected, the least commercially viable, and, and it's so like it just it's lovely. so I, I'm not entirely kidding when I say like I actually never formally told my parents I was just like I'm gonna do this I just kind of did it 
And then slowly along the way, like for the, so for my background, I start off as a comic book editor and then I became sort of DC Comics TV, sort of their head of television and all that sort of stuff. And if you think it's hard to, for them to, un, your, your, your immigrant parents understand like making comics, being part of the creative process, but not actually, like they, they cannot fathom, like and they have no idea what an editor, like they just don't, like you take paper, is that what you, like people email you, is that your job? You know, when I was a TV executive, that was even worse. So my father was like, so you write the shows? Like, no, no, I don't write the shows. So you own the company? He's like, no, no, that's not my company. Your middle management? Like, let's go with middle management. Let, let's go with middle management. I think that's, that's the best way to sort of handle it. So, so slowly, I feel like at least writing is something they can define in terms of what, I, I, you know, I do. It's like, I do a thing, they can hold it. And, and in that sense, it is, it is the least probably anxiety-inducing creative career choice that I've made with my life after so many years of not understanding anything about the ins and outs of sort of what I, what I do. But, uh, but that's something, honestly, like it wasn't like I sat them down and had to like come out to them as a comic book writer. It was just like more of that like slowly over time, they would see things that had my name on it or they would see, or more, actually more than anything else, family who were comic book fans would tell them how cool something I did was. And they were like, what is this thing? How come you've never talked about it? And then it was kind of like, let's have the conversation. And then like, you're right, you're right. You just keep doing what you're gonna do and we'll just cook. Um, so yeah, so that's what the experience was like in my family. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I kind of I understand that um, where the, the thing itself is so foreign to you, a concept that is so foreign to you that to know someone who is successfully, semi-successfully, whatever it is, even even like eking out a, a a project and a living and earning some money off of it, it's just a concept that is a world apart yeah. for 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 some people. And, and certainly, my parents were not even immigrants. You know, they they live back in India. Um, for them, it, as as a concept, it just doesn't make sense. Even though. My dad, you know, paints, he writes, uh, he's, he's always had an interest in me. I probably get my interest in writing and art from, from him um, and music as well. Um, but the idea was that, yeah, yeah, that's stuff you do because it's fun. And then you have to hate your day job. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no in between. Um, and, you know, to kind of go back to, to Jeremy's point, you can't think about success. In, in those terms, you can't think about like, uh, I have to make money or I have to be a full-time writer or, um, you know, I have to I have to do this or be successful by however I define it in X, Y, Z number of years. Um, when I was a chem when I was studying to be a chemical engineer and when I was a chemical engineer, I had a, I had a very good friend who was an architect. So, you know, came a little bit more from the design and art side of things. Uh, and he said to me that, what's your what's your goal post like what would you consider to be success in comics and at the time um all i wanted to do was write a john constantine story so i was like oh man when i write hellblazer that's when i've been successful and he said a thing to me which you know i argued with at the time but it's entirely true which he said at some point success is just writing the next story the fact that you can do that and you're not worried about it and you're not stressed about where what thing is going to happen you're just writing the next book that's success and i think that ties in nicely to my parents and their experience of it. when i first said listen i'm gonna start writing they're like are you crazy no one's ever done that what does that even mean like you're gonna put words on, on paper and you expect people to pay you for it um but you know it wasn't it wasn't my, my dad still doesn't no image comics. He still doesn't know Marvel and DC. Yeah, sure, he understands Batman. So when I said, hey, I wrote a Batman story, he was like, oh, okay, so you are making something of yourself, um, which was, but he understands now. I think his his approach to this got better once he saw that, oh, he's putting out work. And whether that is monetarily successful or not is besides the point because He's putting it out consistently. He's happy doing what he's doing. And that is the real, that is real creative success is you find happiness in whatever you're doing. You get up in the morning and you go write a piece of, you know, piece of work um, and you, you feel happy about it. That is creative success. 
I agree. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I have, I have an Asian friend um, who told me it was funny. Uh, she was saying it was harder for her to come out as a creative to her parents than it was for her to come out gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything is cool. Like, How are you earning money? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always about the money, which is really frustrating. Whenever I mention over the past 12 years of writing books, um, whenever I'd have a publication come out, it was always on the tip of my, my family's tongue, which is like, this is cool, but how much you make? It's right. like, it's not really the point here. Right. Um, to, to explain that, it's like, you know, to explain that you're basically doing some of this work on spec is really hard for, I think, my parents who are American to accept where it's like, you know, your time should be money. And I agree to an extent, but I think that, you know, I look at it as a trade-off of the time I spent honing my craft was worth it in the end. And it's going to continue to pay off where I'm just producing better work with each book. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so Jeremy, I have a, um, along with being Asian American, you're also non-binary. Um, does, does that at all have any kind of effect on what you write? Um, do you feel a need or a burden to, to represent that as well, um, to, to have that voice be heard? Or is it something that just kind of organically weaves itself into your, into your creativity? Or is that, is that something that you, you, you kind of, how should I put it, actively seek to put out there? 100%, uh, it's an active thing. Um, when I came out in 2017, I looked back at all of the work I'd been producing and I realized I was writing these white male savior stories and it's taken a lot of therapy to unpack why I was doing that. Um, raised by white people, raised to believe that I shouldn't see color, which I think is kind of a disservice to anybody who's, who's POC. Um, and just understanding that, yes, I did that because I think in a lot of ways I view myself as a white American, but kind of unpacking that and, and letting a lot of that go, I realized I'm in this unique position to write about something more authentic and something um, that's just different. So I look back at all my work, past, present, and future, and I, I removed all the whiteness and infused color. And then I realized there were so many more interesting narrative threads that became available to me that weren't otherwise there when you're writing just this, this straight white guy. So uh, it also gave me permission to write more authentically and, and weave in my own personal narratives, which um, has, been, has been resonating with readers. So uh, it's been nice that uh, as scary as that was, it's, it's uh, for the better. Gotcha, yeah. Um, you know, and, and on, on, on that note, dealing with representation in comics, you know, and, and popular culture, you know, there, there's some great stuff being made, of course, we're seeing more of it in films, you know, characters being, um, or actors being cast, um, how, how should I say, appropriately for the characters and the character backgrounds. This, this has been kind of like a, um, a really, uh, I don't know, th this question always gets people riled up, but how do you guys feel about when traditionally white male characters or heroes are recast as a person of color or as females. Do you see that as kind of a step towards, okay, they're trying to work in representation or would you rather they push that aside, let those characters be and just start focusing on original characters um, from the ground up that represent people of color and, 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 you know, and, and underrepresented groups? Um, uh, let's start with uh, Ron, what do you think on that? The characters, they're, they're fiction. They don't, they're not, I mean, they, they exist and they, they, they expand their own weight and their reality and their gravity and, and it affects us uh, as a society and a culture. But in the end, they're malleable, right? I.e., I can, I can write a character one way and then I can get, you know, taken off a book and somebody else comes in, writes them another way. Um, that character has fundamentally changed. Sure, the artist drawing them hasn't drawn them, you know, of a different sex or a different color, but that character has fundamentally changed if two different people are writing them. Uh, so my question is, why, why can't that expand to the way they look? Because the way you are on the inside is one facet and the way you look is also an important cultural facet 
of, of those characters. And there's absolutely no reason um, a character cannot change, um, cannot be portrayed in a different way, as a different sex, as a different uh, cultural heritage, as long as you write it well. I think, I think the problem comes in when you don't understand why you're doing this and why you're changing these characters and what is the point of that? What is the point of representing, you know, Captain America as a black female? What are you, what are you going to do with it? And I think that is the more interesting question. And rather than saying we shouldn't do this, my endeavor would be to say we should absolutely do this and we should push to make that experience, to make that character feel authentic um, and, and kind of celebrate that change uh, and, and find it interesting because that's, that's kind of my general approach to the world. Um, if I find something that is new to me or odd or changed or, or um, is different from what I had assumed it to be, my first reaction is to go, oh, that's cool. How? Why? How does it work? And I think we have lived far too long in a society that has discouraged people people from being okay with that and asking those questions and being curious about seeing people from different backgrounds and seeing people from different cultures uh, you know kind of going back to what Jeremy said you know being taught not to see color I think is a, is a is a artifact of that um, you know don't teach people not to see color teach people to see color and be induced by it and be excited by it um, and I think if we take that approach to the kind of stories we tell and the kind of characters we work with because I mean there's there's characters uh, in, in Indian mythology where they literally change sex depending on what situation they're in there are characters who are held up as paradigms of, of, of paragons of masculinity while you know in you can you can see like in five stories they change form to, to a woman to seduce another god that kind of stuff has always existed and we've kind of trained ourselves to, to put characters and mythologies and stories into these compartmentalized boxes and we can say that oh we can't change them because it's religion because it's fandom because it's canon because it's continuity toss all of that aside just tell good stories and, and you'll find people entertained and excited about it awesome uh, point sec your take uh, it's hard to follow that, but um, <laughs> I was gonna say. But you uh, said it so eloquently. You said, said it very, very well. I mean, the the one thing I will say is, and it's it's always tricky for me to answer this question because, in the course of my career, and again, I said, and I started off as a comic book editor. I started off as a Vertigo editor, and then I sort of became this TV exec, and then became a, a comic book writer. I've always been pro new things. Like comics is such a weird, specific industry where, and and. The success of comics is, is, is making all the other entertainment industries become more like comics, where it's about taking things that are 80 years old and finding ways to make them relevant. And the, the, and, you know, and the industry is based on taking these very, very, very old concepts. And, like, let's, and let's show why a 12-year-old now should be excited about something that's 80 years old. And so I've always been pro, let's create new things so that we there's one less filter to talk about the world that we're in to you, you know to, to there's one less filter to talk about the world we're in sort of through the story so so for me you know and this is a little bit of it, it, it it's it's like you know catty corner to the discussion that we're talking about but they're not totally on it it's just like i'm very pro new things because there's less there, there's less tricks that you have there's less things potential things to stumble upon when you're and more avenues to go when you're creating new things that are specifically tailored to the moment that you're living in. So that's one half of it. And the other half of it is I really agree with sort of what I'm going to say, where it's just that like they're this embracing the specificity of, you know, characters, different backgrounds open. If, if you're going to be in in the business of making old things new again, embracing the specificity of sort of different characters and different backgrounds and different ethnicities opens these characters up and allows you to interrogate what those ideas are in new novel ways that make them more relevant to the contemporary society. So, so yeah, but, um, but yeah, but it's, it's always a tricky thing for me because if you're gonna get, if you're gonna ask me the question, I, I want everyone I know who's working on a Marvel DC book, I buy them all, but I also want them to do just as many creator own books that are new 
exciting concepts because to me that's a pure expression of what they want to say a lot of times. I'd be curious to know your thoughts on the flip side of this where it's a, a, a non-POC person writing a, a POC narrative. Um, I think I do, I, I definitely agree with Rom where, it, you know, characters in fiction is malleable. I think anybody should essentially be able to write stories that they feel compelled to write. But I think it's, it's a sensitive topic and I think it should be done with the utmost of care, meaning if you're, you haven't lived that experience, you really do need to do your research and you can't just swap in a POC character to make your story more interesting. I think that's a cop out. And I think um, it's taking up space from the from people like the three of us who yeah. you know, weren't granted that space to begin with. So I'd be curious. Yeah, and you know, just to kind of expand on, on, on what you brought up, I think there are stories that you can write about people who, who don't, who, like who you don't share a cultural and, and background with, as long as you do your research, as long as you, you kind of understand all of the factors, not just the stuff that you're putting in the story, but everything else that has an effect on how these characters would react, would act, would, would perceive things that are happening to them in the story. But also essentially, there are stories that can only be told from an internal perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no matter how much research you do, it's very difficult to understand what it's like when you are, you know, when you are a person of color who's being abused, when you are, uh, you know, a gay person who has to hide who they are in us because society doesn't accept you. Those, kind, those kinds of struggles are, are existential struggles in, in a lot of ways. And it's very, very difficult to write someone's existential struggle unless you have existed in that struggle. Um, and so I, I, have, I have kind of, there is obviously a gray line somewhere there, but largely I, I think you can look at something and ask, is this a story that I can only write if I have lived it? Is this something I can never experience if I ask someone else what it was like to come out to your parents and have them disown you or something like that? It's very difficult to, to do your research there. But it's easy to do research when you're when you're looking at historic facts, when you're looking at characters against historic backgrounds. So these are all questions that any good writer should be asking themselves when they approach a character, regardless of the, the whether the character is from their own background or not. Yeah, I think it's also too like you know it's it's funny when a question like that it, it is sort of like uh, it it's sort of like the ultimate question that you sort of face as a writer sort of, you know, writ large with sort of, you know, bigger things in terms of like, how, how qualified am I to talk about any experience sort of besides, besides my own? I mean, that's, that's sort of where you're starting from there, right? And so, and then we sort of had these sort of political pressures that are sort of on top of it. Like, I think about that a lot, like, you know, as you mentioned, like Infidel was a book about a Pakistani American Muslim woman. I am, I'm American but that's pretty much sort of where I, you know, where, where, where the, the, those, that, that intersectionality overlap lies. My current book now uh, is about a Chinese American man who was born in Hawaii uh, in, in, the 19th, in 1936. So I'm Chinese on my dad's side. So I have that sort of piece in common. And so for me, like a lot of times when I'm writing, it's, it is sort of, okay, what are the aspects of it that I have in common that I can feel? Because, you know, you can't author anything without authority. So what can, what do I feel like I have authority of in that experience that, that I can sort of connect with? And then there's research to do sort of the other aspects. But I'm also very aware, too, that there's aspects that I can't write about. And it would be, going to, to Ram's point, it would be disingenuous for me to try to steer the story into, into that direction where I, I can't sort of speak it speak to it with the authenticity that I that I would wish because I don't have the lived experience. And then I do have to do the calculus when I'm sort of conceiving the story. It's just like, if that is integral to the story I want to tell, then maybe it's not my story to tell. But if there are places where there are overlap, then maybe it is my it is my story to tell. And 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 I think, you know, the that's kind of the that is kind of the that's a question that you, you know you ask when you're writing sort of anything. And I think one of the reasons why it's sort of become sort of a sensitive topic now is the fact that there was a time where writers, that the people writers were writing about didn't have the luxury to challenge that narrative and say, this is not authentic. And now we live in a society 
where they do have more of that power or more of that, uh, that, that capacity. So there's a part of me that is like, listen, writers can write whatever they want, but they, they have to realize they live in an ecosystem where they will be written back to that where the voices they are writing about will respond and they have to be able to live with the consequences of that, that response. And so sometimes one of the things I see that I tend to have a problem with, with people saying, well, why can't I write about this? It's like, well, no one's clearly saying you can't write about it because you got published, it's on the air, you, have, you got paid to do it. So no one's stopping you from writing yeah. it clearly. You, you just can't take criticism. Yeah, and criticism so, is so, not you know, censorship. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think also to kind of bounce off of that point, another thing that I would like to see more writers do is approach their own stories with some curiosity and humility. Yeah. You know, if you're going to write about something you don't know, there's a story to be told in the fact that you don't understand it, you don't yeah. know it, and there's a curiosity there. Um, you know, I'm reminded of a Jim Kutzi uh, quote, when, when he was asked to lecture students at Harvard, I think he came in and said, good writing is good observation. Not good judgment, not good understanding, but observation. I think if writers understood the difference between making a judgment and making an observation, we'd live in, in entirely different places. Yeah. Um, I think too many writers in the past have made judgments and portrayed them as observations <laughs> without 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 the ability for the people who they're talking about to question and say that no you're making a judgment it is not what you what you think it is it is this other thing which is entirely different which you will never understand because you didn't approach it with curiosity mm -hmm. that was that was excellent <laughs> those are that was such excellent insight uh, thank thank you guys thank you all for that um so um you know, before before we kind of wind it down, I want to ask something kind of fun for you guys. You're you're all creatives, you're all writers. Um, what what is it? Um, how do I phrase this? So, what do you geek out on in popular culture? What what um what inspires you? And even um, who have been your influences? You know, in in, in your craft. Um, let me start with Jeremy. Uh, stuff that I'm obsessed with right now. Um, I'm obsessed with Michelle Zahner's memoir, Crying in H Mart. Uh, she's the front woman for the band Japanese Breakfast, which is another a band I love. So music I've been into recently is uh, obviously Japanese Breakfast. Um, she just debuted a, a, her third album, I think last week. Phoebe Bridgers is I'm a huge fan of, um, and I'll always be obsessed with Nirvana, as you can see. Um, but as far as influences, I think um, the influences change depending on what I'm working on. Uh, so for Made in Korea, I think the direct influences were the works of uh, Alex Garland, who did uh, Ex Machina Devs, which is a Hulu original series. They were both excellent explorations in the AI. Um, Neil Blomkamp's work, even though I think people really don't like Chappie, which is unfortunate. Um, and uh, uh, Spike Jones, uh, his film Her was a huge influence on Made in Korea. Um, and then as far as writing comics, uh, Brian K. Vaughn is, is my hero. All excellent choices. <laughs> How about you, Ron? Well, I'll stick with the music theme. I'm geeking out because I just discovered this band called Polyphia. Um, and they have a guitarist who's a young guitarist, 27 year old, I think, named Tim Henson. Um, and I was listening to one of these YouTube shows where someone said they, they watched him play uh, at a convention. And, and I think it was Tom Morello or someone looked at him and said that this guy's going to change the way we perceive how the guitar is played. And I 100% agree with that observation. Like this guy is doing stuff that is insane. So I've been, I've been using my guitar as this kind of get away from, from writing and baby stuff. So it's my 15 minutes of, this is me and my guitar and no one else. Uh, and I'm trying to, trying to play some of their stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I can't read music, so I use tabs. Um, and, three seconds in my hand starts falling apart from like, what are you doing? <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm geeking out on right now. In terms of influences, I think there's far too many for, for me to kind of distill down to like, this is what it is. Um, again, it changes depending on what I'm working on. Right now I'm kind of obsessed with um, either deep space or deep sea horror. So I'm reading, I'm reading a book called Starfish by Peter Watts, uh, which is quite good. Um, 
Um, it's got all kinds of interesting themes of, of you know, cosmic nothingness and dehumanization through, um, you know, ad ad adapting to, to with, with cyber technologies. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where my head is at at this moment. In terms of comics, um, obviously my colleagues, um, I just started reading Made in Korea, Jeremy, finally oh. after, after you sent it to me. And I had, had already read uh, The Good Asian, both of which are very excellent and everybody should go pick them up. Um, and yeah, I also am part of a writer's studio here in London. I work with uh, Dan Waters, Alex Pacmadol, Ryan O'Sullivan. Um, their work is constantly inspiring. Alex did a issue of Immortal Hulk that I think everyone should go pick up and see what you can do with characters that is still new and relevant. Uh, and I'm reading Homesick Pilots by Dan Waters, which is also great, so you should go pick that up too. Um, in terms of me, uh, I can't continue the music theme because I am like the biggest dummy when it comes to music. And I just, I, I so, it's funny, I, when I was in college, I, I had friends who were like the indie rock guys and they knew everything. And then after I like left them, I like, I had no, like I had to do all that work for myself. I'm like, ah, oh, it's too much work. I can't. No one to tell me what's cool. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> I had to make up my mind for myself. This is too much. I, I'd rather just check out of the whole thing. Um, so, so I can't sort of unfortunately keep the music theme. It's funny when you talk about influences, I was just reminded recently of like my very first influence, uh, who, who still has an enormous sort of impact on me was a short story writer by the name of Grace Paley. And Grace Paley, uh, I think a lot of people are taught, in, if you're in a writing class, you're taught her story or you're, you're given, you're assigned her story to read Conversations with My Father or Goodbye and Good Luck. Uh, she was a writer from the 60s and 70s, but I think that she's a wonderful writer. She was, she was also a poet. Um, she never, never wrote a novel and just wrote short stories. And she has basically three collections of short stories and three collections of poetry. And I think I wanna say a memoir and that's like it. But she also spent the other half of her time being an activist and being a teacher and being politically involved. And she, and I was just sort of reading some stuff about her life, which I found amazing, which is she would, her students would come to her class and see signs that say, no class today, out protesting. And, and one of the things that she would teach is the fact that, uh, or the things that I would say, you know, and then there's an argument that every sort of female writer sort of owes, uh, owes a debt to her, but her work is so political. Her work is so beautiful, but also so political. And, and, and one of the things that she always sort of said was that like, you can't separate those two aspects of your life. You can't be a decent person on the page and a husband or partner or friend like you're the same person everywhere and so to be sort of active means to be active in every aspect of your life it's a, to, to to be that person that's sort of everywhere and and that, and that and it was sort of you know reading her writing was when I when I actually discovered the idea of sort of like you know why be involved in politics or why be involved in like at, you know, incorporating political themes. So she has this great story called Faith in a Tree. And the whole story is about the people in her neighborhood. And it just follows all the different sort of characters in her neighborhood. And then the story by the end of it gets disrupted because a, a political march sort of marches through sort of the neighborhood and it, and it shifts everything in, in the neighborhood. And it became, and I still remember it now, even though I read it over 20 years ago, that it, it's like, oh, this is why you get involved in, in anything, in your work, in, in your life. It's that there are people that you love and politics will find a way to intrude into their lives. And the only way to stop that is to sort of, you know, be, be, be part of that process in, in any aspect of your work. And for, and for Chris Paley, it was, you know, both the creative and, and sort of the professional. And so I was just recently reminded of like how big an influence her. And, and also the fact that I remember how much I regret the fact that like, she never wrote a novel. It was just three volumes of short stories. And I, I mentioned that to a professor and then he's like, yeah, but you don't really need, like when it's that good, you don't really need that much more. And so she kind of like, you know, got me around this idea of just like, you know, it's fine not to have a lot as long as you're happy and proud of the things that you, that things you do sort of put out. So that was the sort of, she was a huge influence on, on me and it's nothing to do with comics. Um, in the world of comics, uh, Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, uh, um, Joe Sacco, um, uh, Chester Brown are all sort of big influences. Uh, you know, like Ram, I, 
I also enjoy the work of all, all the people on this panel. I, even though it's an image panel, I feel the need to like hype up like Layla Star, the many deaths of Layla Star, because it's oh, a yeah. competitive book, but it's awesome. And so I know I've, Ram is probably contracted not to be able to talk about it because it's an image <laughs> panel, but I've signed no such contracts. So I, no, I, no. I, I can do it. I, I'm, I have no such contracts. I, <laughs> I'm happy to talk about all of my books. <laughs> But uh, but yeah but yeah and, and, and if if I'm geeking out about anything right now it's it's uh it, I, I'm watching Sweet Tooth on uh, on Ooh. Netflix and I'm so happy for Jeff Lemire and Jose de la Rubia it's I you know I think it's definitely a sign of like as I get older I get more sentimental but it is one of the things I love about comics is there are it's the people and so to watch things that are celebrate to watch their work being celebrated and then watch to watch their work being you know uh being embraced by more people and potentially go back sort of to the comics like it's been it's really great to just watch you know watch people and again like <laughs> Lemire doesn't need any help like he's got, he writes more books that he can keep track of but uh but it's you know but but all this sort of stuff like whether it's Jeremy book Jeremy's book or, or Ram's book like to watch people find that audience it's so it's so cool yeah, and, it's, and speaking of audience, you know, um, uh, as you know or may not know, um, the San Diego Public Library um, partners up with San Diego Comic Con um, to do events, panels, um, community outreach, um, that kind of thing to promote our craft. Um, and I just wanted to put it out there, put this question out there to all of you. What do you think that librarians, not just here in San Diego or here in America, just everywhere, can do to make sure that, you know, that were represented on the shelves in their collections and in their in their programming. You know how how can they reach out to you? What 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 do you think would be a good first step? Sending an email, maybe. <laughs> I think uh, being a bit more bold in in what books are on the shelves and classifying them appropriately is very helpful. I was on a, a, another panel um, and. Uh, one of the panelists is, is uh, creator of Lumberjanes and Chew saying that, you know, it was, it was being classified incorrectly, which makes it tricky um, mm -hmm. to get it into readers' hands because, you know, librarians and parents have very different views based on what it's classified as, if it's a kid's book or a teen book. Um, so, you know, understanding classic classifications is important, um, but also just providing books that provide better representation for readers so they can see themselves in these books. And I think all three of us write stories with that in mind because it, I think it's important. I think anytime someone mentions a library, um, I'm reminded of just walking into one and going, like, there's so much and just pulling out stuff uh, until the librarian came in and was like, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think translating that experience to the modern day, um, the librarians play such an important role because so many of these things have become digitally cataloged. There's so many libraries now. Um, and so I think, I think personally, um, librarians could play a really important role in, in introducing readers to books and ideas and concepts and stories that they aren't otherwise Privy to, you know, like if someone's only ever read Cormac McCarthy all their lives, and they keep asking for more Western stories. There's ways to use that as a window into other experiences. You know, if someone's only ever read, you know, New York crime noir all their lives, maybe go like, hey, here's the good Asian, which is crime noir, but a different take. Um, and so I think, I think finding windows of connection between readers and and new ideas and new stories from new kinds of authors uh, is, a, is a really important role uh, and as far as reaching out you know email twitter anything i'm, I'm super accessible and very happy to play that, that role to connect connect new readers to to new stories yeah it's it's, it's interesting because like i so i still go to my sort of local library although i will admit most of the time if i go to the library now i'm I'm, I'm ordering something sort of in advance. So I, do, I have less of the browsing sort of experience of sort of walking around. So I don't have that kind of sort of interaction with a librarian, certainly as I did when I, when I was younger. I know from the librarians that I've met, like 
it's such a it's such a powerful and it's sort of amazing job. And I feel so much gratitude to, to, to all the librarians that are that, that that are out there and are working and then sort of engage because like there's this generation of like very engaged librarians, which like blows me away. And and I and I and I it's, it's so imp and it's so impressive. Uh the the what the only thing I, I'm trying to think of like, if there's anything I can sort of add to what sort of Jeremy and Ram has is to say. And and maybe the only thing I can add is is the fact that I think something they both sort of said is that. I think there. I think people sometimes don't realize like what a tiny cottage industry like comics are, and we all are very, very easily approachable. Like I'm sure we answer almost all of our emails and all that and all that kind of stuff. And so, and I know that because people are used to other media where like you know I can't talk to the I don't know how to get in touch with the name of that television writer who created that show or that movie it's like it's not like that in comics at all like it's very it's very easy to get in touch with me it's very easy to get an email from me um so like so i would sort of say that too is like there is this generation i think of you know very progressive and but also very motivated sort of librarians and and you know especially for comics if comics is your jam and you want to introduce me more people to sort of comics like please know that you know the, the distance between you and your favorite comic book creator is is almost literally a DM. Like that's, that's, I mean, you might have people like me who don't know enough how to use them and then will not see the message for like months on end. And that is a very real thing in my life, but, um, but it's very easy to get in touch with comic book creators. If you, if you're looking to sort of, you know, share their work or, 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 you know, uh, uh, introduce more people to sort of their work and, and, and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, to all, all your points, you know, grow, growing up in a family of modest means, the library was definitely a magical place for me, and a huge gateway into my fandoms, into sci-fi and yeah. fantasy. And and I actually did introduce me into comic books. Yeah, you know, and also like, comics so, are such yeah. a such a great gateway into. You know, you might not walk into the library and want to pick up Dune, but right. hey, if you've read enough <laughs> sci-fi comics, you know, a couple of years down the line, maybe you'll be like, oh, I wonder yeah. what Dune is. You know, so yeah, exactly, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny. My my introduction to to Three Musketeers and Alexander Dumas was was one of those back in the '80s. So I'm aging myself here. But the the comic book eyes version of yeah. Three Musketeers, which actually led me to reading the book, yeah. the prose yeah. books. Oh, awesome! You know? And 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 it's funny because I I'm, I love how I see comics finally um, getting the respect it deserves as a legitimate literary form as well, you know, and um. It's got and, and words, right, it's right, got art. What's exactly, done to respect? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep telling people, you know, it, tell me the types of stories you like and I can recommend a comic. Yeah. Like that's how broad the comic book um, catalog is. And yeah. I think people will confuse it with like, you know, cartoons in, in the newspaper, which is an art form in and of itself, but it's, it's not the same. And um, yeah, it's always fun to, you know, hand a comic that you know this person's going into based on what they're into and then they just devour it. And it's like, wow, oh. Nice. Yeah, and then, and I mean, I've known this since childhood, like libraries and librarians are so underappreciated, yeah. and yet they're such a valuable resource to the community. Um, so, you know, my Under message- Under libraries, to make people smarter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All about so libraries. For your libraries, and I, and I think that the, the main message I'm hearing from you guys is for the librarians or any pro person dealing with programming or acquiring materials is just ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The words that you get is a no, and you go from there. I mean, that's yeah. kind of been my philosophy pitching ideas. I've got yeah. enough no's to, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to believe in that. And, um, you know, thank you all for joining me. Rom, thank you again for, sure. for being a trooper. <laughs> and, um, you know, before we go, um, if, if you guys want to plug anything you're working on or just shout out the books you're currently on, um, please go ahead. Um, let's start with Rom. Um, well, since Pornstack mentioned it, we'll start. There are many deaths of Layla Star is currently coming out, and uh, issue three is out next week, I think. So everyone go pick it up. Uh, Blue and Green from Image uh, had a recent reprinting, uh, and so I imagine will be restocked very soon with all your comic book stores and retailers and such. So um, any any fans of horror, jazz, noir, or just beautiful art, go pick it up. Um, 
I'm also, you know, writing a plethora of DC Marvel books, um, which you can all find out if you if you come look at the right ROM on Twitter. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do a 20 minute long list. So on on to you guys. Oh, go ahead. Parker. Oh, okay. I'll jump. I can, I can jump from there. Sure. Uh, I've got uh, the Good Asian that's currently coming out. Uh, issue. Well, issue two is coming out this week in a couple days, although I think maybe by the time this airs, issue two will already be out. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it will be by issue three at that point. Uh, but The Good Asian is coming out monthly for until early next year at the very least. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and then, and I, of course, I still have Infidel. You can get a copy of Infidel wherever books are sold, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and then and that's, that's available. Um, main career is out now. Uh, the first issue went back to print, so the reprint will be available the same day as the second issue, which is June, June 30th. But depending on this airs, uh, it might be on to issue three. Um, I would also recommend everybody pick up Blue and Green. As a huge jazz fan, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's awesome. Show. Um, and I have, I can't really give a, a whole lot of details, but I have my first prose novel cool. that I think will be out in the winter, if not early 2022. Awesome, awesome. And then we'll just go um, back in reverse order. Um, for you, those of you that have social media, um, how can our fans uh, follow you? Uh, pretty easy, just Jeremy Holt Books across social media and my website's jeremyholtbooks.com. I'm real underscore porn sack on Twitter and real underscore PSAC on Instagram. I am the right ROM on Twitter as opposed to the wrong one, that guy. Um, and and um, on Instagram, I'm Rob B. Writes. I'm probably most active on Twitter. So that's the place to come follow me. Awesome. Thank you again, everyone. Um, it's funny. I think um, I was so excited to get this going. I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning of the panel. <laughs> I am Vince Alvindia. I'm a local San Diegan, been a fan of Comic-Con forever, and it has been my honor to speak to you all and chat to you all about your creative process and about your books. And thank you so much for being generous with your time and with your insight. And I appreciate all of you. I'm a big fan. So thank, thank you, you all. Thanks so much.